in the southern Nebraska panhandle, just above the Colorado border. A Union Pacific intermodal train sprints west between North Platte and Cheyenne. It is following a route that united a nation from coast to coast. The route of the first transcontinental railroad. Welcome to the Sydney Sub. Running nearly 220 miles between North Platte, Nebraska and Cheyenne, Wyoming, the Sydney subdivision is a double-track mainline that has carried Union Pacific trains for over 150 years. This historic transportation corridor once included the Pony Express and Overland Stage. Today, it sees a parade of increasingly long and heavy trains running to and from Bailey Yard the largest railroad classification yard in the world. In part one of this two-part series, we will cover the western half of the Sydney subdivision beginning in Cheyenne. Trains climb east over Archer Hill and sprint into Nebraska at Pine Bluff. We will visit several small towns along the way, each with a history all its own. Monster Manifest trains make up the majority of traffic, with some trains pushing two and a half miles in length. Also unit grain, coal, and intermodal trains sprint across the Cornhusker State. Our summertime visit coincided with Big Boy number 4014's eastbound excursion across the subdivision, and we will get to see this giant 4000 class engine at several locations. Join us now for Union Pacific's Sydney Subdivision Part 1. Part of Union Pacific's North Platte area, the Sydney subdivision covers 217.6 miles, most of which are in the state of Nebraska. The first 43.8 miles are in Wyoming, and there is a short jog down to Julesburg, Colorado, which we will visit in part two. At the west end, Cheyenne is milepost 509.5. Cars are switched at the yard here, and mainline trains change crews. With an elevation of 6,058 feet, Cheyenne is the highest point on the subdivision. Heading east, the double-track mainline begins at Barnett, then climbs a short 0.7% grade to Archer, milepost 501.4. From this point, it is nearly a steady descent for eastbounds all the way to North Platte, passing Hillsdale, Burns, and Egbert. At Pine Bluffs, we enter the state of Nebraska and continue through Bushnell, Kimball, Owasco, Dix, Jacinto, and Potter. Just east of here, the railroad bends to the south around Point of Rocks, creating the sharpest curve on the subdivision called Buffalo Bend. From there, we pass Brownson, a connection point with BNSF's Angora subdivision, serviced by the Sydney and Lowe Railroad, and finally, Sydney. Milepost 410.2, the location of a small yard and flyover where the BNSF main line crosses over the UP. On July 4, 1866, Grenville Dodge of the Union Pacific Railroad announced the selection of a town site in what was then known as the Territory of Dakota. The railroad called it Crow Creek Crossing. Residents called it Cheyenne. Today it boasts a population of around 65,000, making it the most populous city in Wyoming. 
The big event of the summer is the Cheyenne Frontier Days Rodeo, which takes place in the last week of July and is one of the largest of its kind in the world. While the fun and festivities are going on in Depot Square, behind the famous depot, the monotonous tasks of a mainline railroad are carried out around the clock. An eastbound manifest for North Platte, Nebraska pauses for a crew change at Cheyenne Yard. The roundhouse, turntable, and machine shop are home to UP's steam program, a one-of-a-kind operation on a big Class 1 American railroad. At this very moment, Big Boy number 4014, the largest operating steam locomotive in the world, is being readied for its 2021 summer tour of 10 western states. Union Pacific tracks reached Cheyenne on November 13, 1867, and the first train arrived the following day. Cheyenne grew so quickly, it was nicknamed the Magic City of the Plains. Over the past century and a half, the Magic City has continued to grow up around the railroad. The Yard Tower now sits between the north and southbound lanes of Interstate 180, which provides motorists quick access to the heart of Wyoming's capital city. Part of Union Pacific's North Platte area, Cheyenne marks a crew change point between the Laramie subdivision, tackling Sherman Hill to the west, the Greeley subdivision, heading south along the front range between Denver, Colorado and Spear, Wyoming, and the Sydney subdivision, running east to North Platte, Nebraska. While mainline trains pause to change crews and pick up or drop off blocks of cars, a switch crew works throughout the yard. EMD SD40-2s, once the backbone of UP's road power fleet, are now more commonly found in yards, such as UP 1905. Built in April of 1973 as UP 3205, the engine is now designated as an SD40N, having gone through an extensive rebuild, including a refurbished cab, air conditioning, positive train control, and completely rewired electrical cabinets and new microprocessor system, which replaces Dash 2 modules. The rebuild program has given new life to these classic EMDs. The Sydney subdivision follows Camp Stool Road east out of Cheyenne and past a refinery located at the base of Archer Hill. Milepost 506 is still attached to an old telegraph pole, an increasingly rare site along a mainline railroad. UP 6813 West leads a grain train through the sag at the base of the hill and into Cheyenne for a crew change. Archer Hill is a short 0.7% grade that runs for around 2.5 miles east of Cheyenne, with a much longer descent on the east side. The train powers through the sag with the aid of Norfolk Southern SD-70 Ace, number 1125.
The lights of Cheyenne shimmer in the pre-dawn dark from our position near the top of Archer Hill. The light of a westbound shimmers also as the early morning train crests the 6,012-foot summit, the second highest point on the Sydney subdivision. The UP track chart gives top honors to Cheyenne, which is 46 feet higher. This is a great place to watch as well as listen to trains battling the grade in either direction. The summer of 2021 may be remembered as the summer of smoke from numerous wildfires burning across the western U.S. and Canada. Instead of a golden hour at the start and end of each day, a red ball stared out of what was supposed to be the sky. This was the case on the morning of August 5th, yet it was a good morning to be on Archer Hill as big boy number 4014 stomped up the grade on the first day of its summer tour. The first leg of the journey will take it to Sydney, Nebraska, and we will see it several times today. You have to be trackside to appreciate just how loud a big boy is when pulling a grade. Big Boy is a tough act to follow, but UP has revenue trains to run, so let's hang out on Archer Hill for a while and see what's coming. UP 2765 is on the point of a westbound coal train out of the Powder River Basin. The hoppers have the reporting mark of CSUX, referring to the City of Colorado Springs Department of Electrical Generation. There are two coal-fired plants in Colorado Springs, Martin Drake and Ray Nixon. Both are slated to be shut down by the year 2030. So if you like documenting coal trains, you may want to catch these cars while you can.
SD70 Ace number 8650 leads eastbound grain empties over Archer Hill. Geographically, Archer Hill is where the railroad leaves Crow Creek for a new course of Lodgepole Creek. The ruling grade on the east side is 0.7% between Hillsdale and Archer, although it is nearly a steady downhill run all the way to North Platte. A maintenance of way gang is tied down at Hillsdale as UP 5433 West takes a manifest train up Archer Hill on Main 1. In recent years, Union Pacific has embraced the concept of Precision Scheduled Railroading, or PSR for short. This attempt to streamline railroad operations has resulted in fewer but longer trains. Sometimes it may appear that two different trains were simply combined into one long train, like we see here. In this case, it looks like an auto rack train was tacked onto the rear of this manifest. Long manifest trains are very common on the Sydney subdivision. UP 5987 leads a 13,000 foot train bound for North Platte.
On our eastbound journey across the Sydney subdivision, we will pass many small towns like Burns, Wyoming, where the tallest structure is the water tank, followed by the steeple of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, which still holds service every Sunday morning. Burns started life as simply a railroad siding. The town was built in 1907 by German Lutherans who wanted to name the town after Martin Luther. History shows it was the railroad siding name that stuck. The tracks skirt the north end of town where grain elevators can be found. UP 5968 leads a long stack train west on an overcast yet warm afternoon. UP 5557 leads a westbound stack train past the elevators at Burns.
The double track main line continues in a southeasterly heading, passing the remains of an old water tank at Egbert, near milepost 477. Track work is going on in the nearby siding and Y track on the north side of the mains. Our vantage point is from a little used spur track on the south side. UP 7954 East glides down the gentle slope away from the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plateau of Wyoming. This little hamlet was named for Augustus A. Egbert, a conductor who joined the railroad in 1867 and worked his way up to superintendent. It was once a stop on the old Lincoln Highway, 11 miles west of Pine Bluffs. Egbert boasted a hotel, garage, and telephone. UP 5653 West continues its climb away from North Platte. In the past 180 miles, it has gained 2,483 feet in elevation. In another 26 miles, it will crest Archer Hill.
Our final stop in Wyoming is the border town of Pine Bluffs. Originally called Rock Ranch, the name Pine Bluffs was given by the railroad after, simply enough, the pine trees that grew along the nearby bluffs. A westbound grain train led by UP 6482 passes the large grain bins just after entering the state of Wyoming. A group of rail fans and interested locals line up on an overpass as the 4014 approaches Pine Bluffs for a brief stop. Back in the days of the big cattle drives out of Texas, Pine Bluffs had the distinction of being the largest cattle shipping point on the Union Pacific, as several cattle trails converged here. A local attraction is the Texas Trail Museum, where a lot of history of the area is preserved. Speaking of history, plenty of historical artifacts can be found right along the old Lincoln Highway, which runs right through town. Pete's service station seems to be a collecting point for old gas pumps, amongst other things. Just east of town, an abandoned gas station rests in the weeds. It was built right on the state line and served motorists traveling Route 30. Traffic dried up with the completion of nearby Interstate 80 in 1974, and today the old Lincoln Highway is only lightly used, mostly by locals or the occasional rail fan, since it parallels the double-track mainline. Still, it is a bit of a mystery how this old state line station has remained, mostly untouched, since it was closed decades ago. Nebraska is known as the Cornhusker State, and this cornfield is a taste of things to come. The Sydney subdivision enters the state of Nebraska at milepost 465.7. After a brief stop at Pine Bluffs, the 4014 resumes today's journey to Sydney. Since Big Boy had not been on an excursion since 2019, the first few days of travel were light, covering only around 100 miles each day. After conquering Archer Hill, Big Boy will have an easy time drifting across the state of Nebraska as the elevation drops, the further east we go.
It's early August, and wild sunflowers decorate the right-of-way for most of our trip across the Sydney sub. UP 8914 is in charge of an eastbound stack train on Main 2, with four of its units on the point and two mid-train DPUs. The train approaches a high-speed curve at milepost 460. The Sydney subdivision cuts across the southern end of the Nebraska Panhandle, following the course of Lodgepole Creek to a point west of Julesburg, Colorado. The elevation is just under 5,000 feet, the climate semi-arid. Here we find patches of dry land and irrigated farmland, as the rails swing to the northeast through the small community of Bushnell. UP 1871 powers a local which has just picked up a few hoppers that were spotted at the town's grain elevators. The train slowly heads west on Main 1. The 1871 is another SD40M rebuild that began life in November of 1980 as UP 3794. It has had a 41-year career with the Union Pacific Railroad. The local has stopped on Main 1 as UP 5883 runs solo on the point of an eastbound auto rack train on Main 2. Bushnell was founded in 1867. It was named for Cornelius Scranton Bushnell, a railroad executive and shipbuilder who was instrumental in the development of ironclad ships for the Union Navy during the Civil War. The most famous was the USS Monitor, which fought the Merrimack in the Battle of Hampton Roads in March of 1862. This is also the birthplace of professional basketball player Ken Sailors, whose career in the 1940s and 50s included NBA teams like the Denver Nuggets and Boston Celtics. The all-star player's claim to fame was the invention of the jump shot. That's quite a few ripples in history for the old little town of Bushnell. UP 7937 races east with a manifest.
Between Bushnell and Kimball, the railroad heads nearly due east through rolling hills dotted with farms. This roadside historical marker points out the McGinnis Irrigation Flume, which was used to channel water through the rough topography of the region. The patented galvanized steel flumes were manufactured in nearby Kimball. This remaining example is on the National Register of Historic Places and is easily seen from the Lincoln Highway. An underpowered monster grain train heads west near Oliver. This train was struggling to make 20 miles per hour after two of its mid-train DPUs had issues. The crew was not very confident they could make Cheyenne within their 12 hours of service. UP-7464 is the lone GE working mid-train, with the 8178 and NS-1125 just a couple of free-loading motors on a slow ride to Cheyenne. Instead of adding additional horsepower, these two dead engines are adding an additional 850,000 pounds of dead weight to the already heavy train. The remaining five units are churning out a combined 22,000 horsepower, keeping these steel wheels a-turning. Kimball is milepost 445.5 on the Sydney subdivision timetable. It began life in 1870 as Antelopeville when tracks were first laid and consisted of a siding, telegraph office and coal station. The elevation here is 4,715 feet above sea level. A Titan I nuclear missile stands in a nearby park representing the complex of Minuteman missile silos that were constructed here during the Cold War beginning in 1962. Kimball is the center of the largest complex of ICBM sites in the world, with about 200 silos in the area. This Titan I came from Chico, California after it was removed from service in the mid-1960s. The second stage was blown off in a windstorm in 2009 and has not been replaced. Another piece of history can be found right across from the railroad on West 1st Street. This is the Kimball City Artificial Ice, Light and Power Plant, which provided electricity for the whole town continuously until 1980. The big power plant relies on five big diesel engines, which turn generators that produce electricity. Picture a giant stationary diesel electric locomotive. The plant is still operational and is put online whenever power demands are high. In case you were wondering, ice was made at this plant to keep household ice boxes cold during the summer months before home refrigeration was a reality. Just as the milkman delivered milk in the early 1900s, the ice man delivered ice to keep that milk cold. There is so much incredible history in this one little Nebraska town. On the other side of the tracks, a giant cathedral of grain elevators dwarf a lone GP9, owned by a regional co-op. It was built in October of 1955 for the Pennsylvania Railroad and originally numbered 7011. 
Another interesting diesel is on the point of an eastbound Portland, Oregon to Global to Chicago Z train that nearly catches us by surprise. Look fast. UP 1943, the spirit of the Union Pacific, honors our nation's armed forces. The number and name comes from a B-17 flying fortress that was christened the Spirit of the Union Pacific in 1943. It was assigned to the 571st Bomber Squadron. On its fifth mission, it was shot down over Germany. Kimball was a stop on Big Boy 4014's eastbound run. Traveling somewhat slower than the Z, the Big 4884 slowly passes the elevators on Main 2. The string of cement hoppers was added to the train to provide sufficient braking power for the heavy steam locomotive, in addition to the dynamic braking provided by SD70M number 4015. Being a freight move, it was nice to see the bay window caboose bringing up the rear of the train. While Big Boy pauses in Kimball, let's continue east. An eastbound manifest led by UP 7346 passes a cornfield as it nears the former station of Owasco. Owasco is a 10,472-foot siding on the north side of the double-track main line. It is marked by a classic signal bridge near milepost 437.2. It was named after the nearby Circle Arrow Ranch Company, with the O symbolizing the circle. With thousands of station names throughout the UP system, it's good to be original. A combine works just north of the tracks 
Our visit came during the end of harvest for grains such as spring oats, rye, and winter wheat. This combine is a John Deere S670 built in East Moline, Illinois. It is powered by a six-cylinder diesel engine rated at nearly 400 horsepower. Its onboard grain tank can hold 300 bushels. When full, it can unload on the fly to a chaser bin and keep on harvesting. It is outfitted with a Shellborn Reynolds stripper hitter. Rather than cutting the stalks near the ground with a conventional sickle, the stripper header has a spinning rotator with fingers that strip grain from the crops as the combine moves forward. Stripper headers are proving valuable in dry land farming, where soil moisture and nutrients are important. Leaving more residue in the field improves the condition of the soil. The decrease in material passing through the combine means less wear and tear on equipment. While the harvest continues on, a short, fast westbound Z train led by UP 8004 ducks under the signal bridge at Owasco. The prevailing winds have changed, bringing a thick layer of smoke across Nebraska. The signals guarding Main 1 have just gone high green for an eastbound running wrong main due to a slower train ahead on Main 2 at Potter, who is waiting for this train to pass. Maintenance of way gangs are working between Sydney and Julesburg, reducing the line to single track running in the miles ahead. Visibility is somewhat better as UP 4014 continues on the last leg of today's run to Sydney.
Just east of Owasco is the small hamlet of Dix. Like so many of the towns we have seen, Dix started life as a siding on the Transcontinental Railroad. The settlement was founded in 1886 and named after Dixon, Illinois. To avoid confusion with the real Dixon, the letters O-N were dropped from the name. Its landmark is the tall Frenchman Valley Co-op grain elevator. The co-op started in 1912 and today serves a large area in Nebraska, as well as Kansas, Colorado, and southeastern Wyoming. We will continue to see their elevators as we head east along the Sydney subdivision. Here is that monster grain train working hard on its westbound run. Nebraska has been home to the Union Pacific ever since President Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railway Act in 1862. Today, UP has 1,065 miles of track in the Cornhusker State, in addition to its 31,200 miles of track in 22 other western states. Speaking of statistics, there are 7,600 locomotives on the UP roster, four of which are powering this westbound Z-Train past milepost 432 east of Dix. It is running wrong main due to the track work.
UP 8230 slowly eases to a stop on Main 1 at milepost 432 due to the maintenance of way work ahead. Since the air was heavy with smoke, we decided to come back another day. UP 8062 races east on Main 2 with a manifest for North Platte, including a wide load. Due to the wide load, the manifest was ordered to stop when meeting westbound trains. Those trains were restricted to 20 miles per hour when making a meet. BNSF C4 number 6926 lends a hand to the rear of the special manifest. UP 5719 West splits the signals near milepost 430.5. Today is the day of interesting loads. The loads are unfinished commuter equipment from Swiss manufacturer Stadler. Looks like we are getting an unofficial unveiling of the last unit. This is another long manifest pushing three miles between the lead unit and Fred. UP 9024 splits the difference as a swing helper. Distributed power is what makes long trains like this possible. Besides spreading the pulling power throughout the train, the extra long brake pipe can be charged more quickly and evenly with locomotives air compressors on both ends and in the middle.
UP 7036, AC 60-44 AC, leans on the rear drawbar of the heavy manifest. UP 8078 sprints east for North Platte on Main 2. Our compass heading begins to dip a little to the southeast as we near Potter. UP 8016 heads west into the smoky sunset on track one. As the big red ball sinks toward the western horizon, another day of rail fanning draws to a close. UP 4014 heads for Potter.
The bay window caboose sure puts a nice period on the end of that train. Potter is milepost 426.4, named for Joseph S. Potter, a director with the Union Pacific. This preserved depot was built in 1885 and remained here until 1971. At that time, it was moved to Buffalo Bend, a sharp curve on the UP three miles east of here, and finally returned to Potter after being donated to the village in 1989, where it has been restored and displayed to this day. Like so many towns on the line, Potter has a caboose on display courtesy of the Union Pacific. The Sydney subdivision can be a racetrack. UP 8877 heads west through Potter. The second unit is a Tier 4 SD70 Ace number 3082. It meets UP 9055 East. Three miles east of Potter is a natural landmark known as Point of Rocks. The railroad is forced around the southern flank of the Rocky Bluffs, creating the sharpest curve on the Sydney subdivision. The curve is known as Buffalo Bend. UP 7896 takes a westbound Z train through the curve on Main 1.
Buffalo Bend garnered the nickname where the east peters out. Point of Rocks may be the first resemblance to mountains as westbound trains climb through the southern Nebraska panhandle. This scene was shot on the day Big Boy went east to Sydney. After the day's run was over, a few rail fans congregated at Point of Rocks to watch the mainline action. Each gets their own perspective of this westbound stacker. SD-70 Ace, number 8839, is on the point of an eastbound manifest beneath Point of Rocks as the train glides down Main 2. The remnants of old homesteads dot the landscape along the route of the Pony Express, Overland Stage, and First Transcontinental Railroad. If those stones could talk, what amazing history they could share. This may be just a small ripple in historical events, but we capture UP 8016 heading west on a summer evening. The train has just passed Brownson, a junction with the Sydney and Lowe, a short line that interchanges cars with UP and BNSF at Huntsman.
UP7453 takes an empty grain train east into Sydney on Main 2. Just outside of Sydney, a red barn is a local landmark off the old Lincoln Highway, surrounded by cornfields. The west end of Sydney is milepost 410.2. A rail train and string of stored engines populate a few of the yard tracks, while UP 5457 takes the daily UPS Z train out of town. A nice surprise is the mid-train remote. A former Chicago and Northwestern C44-9AC, number 8804. This is the last remaining CNW unit in original paint that still turns a wheel for the UP. The rail train is powered by UP 5814. This GE is classified by the UP as an AC 4400 CW CTE. It was delivered to Union Pacific in February of 2002. The two EMD SD 70Ms behind it in storage were built around the same time, with the 4554 built in the year 2000 and 3859 in 2004. For the time being, these units, along with several sister locomotives, sit in mothballs along with a few older GE-9s. EMD owned the diesel locomotive market until being dethroned by GE beginning in the late 1980s. Many vintage EMDs, like the very successful and reliable SD40-2, continue to serve the rail industry. But the newer road power hasn't fared so well. 
UP owns the lion's share of SD70Ms, with 1,452 purchased between 1992 and 2004. While thunderstorms brew overhead, UP 6016 heads west through Sydney on an evening run to Cheyenne. Four more SD-70Ms are dead in consist. Sydney is the halfway point between Cheyenne and North Platte. Named for Sydney Dillon, a president of the Union Pacific, the town grew around the military base of Fort Sydney, where soldiers were stationed to guard the Transcontinental Railroad against Indian attacks. Fort Sydney's commanders and officers' quarters are still here today, serving as the Cheyenne County Museum. Like Kimball, Sydney also has its own power plant, not far from the UP mainline. This plant was built in 1915 and originally ran on steam. The plant was dieselized in the 1940s and today runs both on diesel and natural gas. The plant has five engines inside including this Fairbanks Morse from 1931. It would be great to see these engines in operation, but for now, we will settle for the variety that runs on the rails. At the east end of town, the BNSF Angora subdivision flies over the UP, where trains from Alliance Nebraska head south into Colorado. BNSF 9277 heads south through Sydney with a unit train of Powder River Basin coal. Here, the train flies over Route 30.
Now if we could just get a UP train for an over-under shot. That'll do. The BNSF has manned helpers tacked onto the rear DPs and they suddenly come into view. Sydney is on the western edge of the Midwestern wheat growing region, and agriculture has been a big part of this town's existence. Like many western towns, Sydney had a colorful past, earning nicknames like Sinful Sydney or the toughest town on the tracks. Between 1876 and 1881, Sydney was the closest railroad shipping point for gold that was discovered in the Black Hills and Deadwood. During that time period, the town was alive and sinning with 80 saloons and several gambling halls, not to mention brothels. Not far from the BNSF flyover, you can find the remains of the old Boot Hill where some of the toughest outlaws and some of their victims are buried. An effort has been made to preserve the old cemetery with grave markers that tell us a little bit more than those buried here can. It's August 6, 2021, and Big Boy number 4014 is being ready to depart Sydney for the second leg of its journey to North Platte. While the final preparations are being made, UP 6443 East passes by on Main 2, the eastbound track.
With everything ready to go, the Omaha dispatcher is toned up. E4014, go ahead, over. Yeah, we're ready to depart Sydney here. I'd like to get talked out, uh, authority to enter main track two. Uh, and proceed east, over. Okay, understand you're looking to enter uh, main track two at the east end of Sydney and proceed east. Is that correct for the UP4014? You're running PTC? That is correct. Enter main track two. Uh, East end of Sydney and TCS number 7921. Okay, TCS 7921, I'll show as operative. Your authority should be in PTC. Let me know when you have it. All right. Uh, you'll show 7921 operative, and we'll check our PTC for that authority to enter main track to East end of Sydney. Thank you. As you may have gathered from the radio conversation, the 4014 has been outfitted with PTC. So this 1940s era steam locomotive can operate on the modern day mainline. The UP steam program has plans to install PTC in the 844 as well, as the railroad plans to keep both of these classic steam locomotives operating in the digital world of the 21st century. As the 4014 departs, a westbound passes on main one. The big boy slowly makes its way to the east end of Sydney Yard, where it will enter Main 2. By mid-afternoon, the 4014 will arrive at the largest rail yard in the world in North Platte. But that's a story for another time. In the meantime, we hope you've enjoyed this seldom visited portion of Union Pacific's overland route through the Nebraska Panhandle. As always, until next time. Thanks for watching.